Okay, so we're gonna take a little break from all the doom and gloom of the coronavirus and talk about something that longtime Bay Area residents love to hate, which is congestion and general increase in traffic in the Bay Area. So what I'm going to do is talk to you very briefly about growth and changes in the Bay Area and then spend the most time talking about some implications, implications for transportation, infrastructure. I'm also going to talk about homelessness and finally migration and then give you our outlook for the Bay Area. So it's impossible to tell the story of the Bay Area in one presentation, let alone one slide, but looking at some employment trends is a good snapshot. So this is showing you employment in various industries for the Bay Area at two different time periods. So in blue, January 2000, and in yellow and red, December 2019. So before I go too much further, whenever I say the Bay Area here, I mean uh, six Bay Area counties. So um, Alameda, um, Contra Costa, Marin, San Mateo County, San Francisco, and Santa Clara. So what this is showing you is that I've ordered these industries by which, um, so from left to right, which grew the most between those two time periods. So on the left, you can see that healthcare grew most in terms of number of jobs created. And then on the far right, durable goods actually shrunk, which is why that bar is in red. So what I want you to take away is that this chart is consistent with the notion of the Bay Area as a tech center. So you can see that information, which has a lot of tech jobs, that grew a lot, and as did uh, professional and business services. And one of the key categories there is computer system design, which is in technology. So this gets at some of the positive sides of growth, the upsides, you know, employment, innovation, but there are downsides too, downsides like traffic and congestion. And that's what I want to spend the most time talking about today. So the metrics that I'll talk about are in some sense a signal of good things. So more traffic means more people are going to more jobs and that's, that's a good sign, but there are also downsides of this traffic and this congestion. And it's important to think about the costs, costs like this, because when individuals and firms decide where they're going to live and where they're going to work, they have to weigh the costs and benefits of living and working in a particular area. And if costs start to rise relative to benefits, then that sort of becomes relevant for their location decisions. So let's start with commute times. Commute times are getting longer. This is showing you the average time in minutes for a commute for residents of those six Bay Area counties I mentioned before. And the pattern is commutes are taking longer. Part of this is that people are traveling longer distances. So more people are now crossing county lines to get to work. And also that a fixed distance is taking a longer amount of time just because there's more traffic on the roads. Patterns look similar when you look at carpoolers and when you look at people who are taking public transportation. There are more people on the roads. There are more people on the bridges. This shows you the total annual bridge traffic for uh, the bridges run by the Bay Area Toll Authority. So San Mateo Bridge, Bay Bridge, bridges like that, and also for the Golden Gate Bridge. And you can see that both are up from their lows in the 2007 to 2008 recession. There are also more people riding public transportation. So looking at BART, this is showing you the average weekday ridership and the trend has been up over time. But more important than that is that peak trains, so during peak commute hours, those trains are at or very close to capacity. Caltrain uh, you know, shows, a, shows a similar pattern. Ridership is up, so that's in blue on the left axis, but more important, what I want to highlight is capacity is, is Caltrain's getting close to capacity. So you can see on the right there that the percent of occupied seats, particularly in the into San Francisco in the morning, out of San Francisco in the afternoon direction, is getting very close to 100%. And this comes at a time when transit assets are aging. This is showing you the percent of revenue vehicles, so things on wheels that are transporting customers that are classified as being not in a good state of repair. So that's beyond their usable life. So you can see that BART, Samtrans, Caltrain, and Golden Gate all have more than 50% of their revenue vehicles not in a good state of repair. Now this is important because as more people are using the systems, older and older vehicles are going to tend to break down more and cause more delays for all of those additional people who are riding public transportation. So now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about a different kind of cost. 
and that is homelessness. So I want to be careful not to say or not to state or claim or give you the impression that growth in the Bay Area has caused homelessness in the Bay Area. I'm not saying that, but homelessness is certainly an issue that the Bay Area and San Francisco especially has to deal with. So I'm not going to talk about the social and political aspect or issues associated with homelessness. I'm going to focus instead on the economic costs. And one way to think about an economic cost of homelessness is that uh, late last year, Oracle announced that they were moving their conference out of San Francisco. So lost conference revenue was one potential economic cost because in their announcement, Oracle cited, among other things, uh, accommodation costs, but also street conditions. So what I'm going to do is first tell you about the data that I use. So data on um, homelessness that's location specific and very frequent is difficult to get. So what I'm going to use is the database of 311 calls for the city of San Francisco. So 311 is essentially the customer service number for the city. Anyone can call that number about anything. And one of the things that you can call or all calls are categorized and one of the categories is encampment cleanup requests. So that I'm going to use as a proxy for homelessness. And each of those calls is associated both with a category and with a location of the encampment that's being requested to be cleaned up. So let's look at what the data look like over time. This shows you the total number of monthly calls to 311 categorized as encampment cleanup requests. And there are two things I want you to take away. One is the pattern is generally up over time. And the second is that there's strong seasonal patterns. So in the winter, you tend to see fewer calls. But that doesn't give you a sense of how it's distributed or how these uh, encampments are distributed over space. So now you're going to, or now you're seeing a simple animation that shows you the locations of encampments over time. And you can see that as the animation goes, there are more and more blue dots, more and more encampments. Now we're getting into the middle of this, or the middle of the last year, and we're gonna end in December of 2019. So now how are we going to link encampments to business activity? We're going to look at three metrics of business activity. One, business openings, business closings, and building permits. And these all roughly capture business investment. And I'm going to look at two kinds of correlations. One, uh, I'm going to call spatial correlation. So I'm going to ask, are two sets of points tending to cluster together? So do you tend to find gold points near blue points? Or are the two points pushing each other apart? Do you tend to find blue points away from gold points? I'm also going to look at what I'm calling, for lack of a better term, simple correlation. So do points that have higher values of the variable y also tend to have higher values of the variable x? At the city level, spatial analysis indicates that business or building permits and encampments tend to cluster together. So you tend to find the two things in the same location. Um, if you create a data set that's by zip code and by month and ask how do counts of encampment calls and counts of either business openings, business closings, and building permits um, correlate with each other, you find positive correlations across the board. And I think this is maybe not surprising, maybe not too interesting. It's sort of just saying that in areas where there are more people, there tend to be more, tends to be more business activity, and there also tends to be more encampments. So instead, what we're going to, instead of looking across zip codes, now we're going to look within a zip code. And here the spatial correlations start to tell a little bit of a different story. So now you're starting to see some areas where building permits and encampments tend to push each other apart. And if you go back to that data set that's by year and by zip code and estimate the relationship between business activity and encampments within a zip code over time, then what you find is that more encampments are associated with more business closings and fewer building permits. So I don't wanna leave the impression that this is a causal relationship. I'm not saying that encampments cause reductions in business activity. I'm not saying that because a third variable like gentrification could be causing both. 
But what does seem to be the case is that there is a statistically significant relationship between homelessness or between encampments and business activity. So what does all this mean? I've talked about a number of different costs, kind of so what, who cares? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it seems like costs are rising. And the question is, are costs rising enough relative to the benefits of locating in the Bay Area that you start to see people changing their location decisions? If this is the case, you would expect to see people um, not coming to the Bay Area as frequently or people leaving the Bay Area more frequently. So let's see if that's the case. Here you are looking at the net number of people who started in the Bay Area and then left for, on the left panel, either another county in California, including a county that's nearby but not in the Bay Area, and on the right panel, people who left for a different state. So both of these charts are uh, sort of from the perspective of the Bay Area, so a negative number means a net outflow. For example, looking at the left-hand panel, from 2000, 11 until 2012, the chart shows you that roughly 6,000 people on net left the Bay Area. So I want to make a few comments. Uh, first, uh, or actually I want to make a few comments on that uh, big increase in people leaving the Bay Area. So it's sort of the negative number becomes larger in magnitude from about 2015 to 2017. There are a number of reasons why this might be more dramatic than what actually happened. Uh, first, you see this pattern all across the US, this large increase in people moving. So this is not something specific to the Bay Area. Second, other sources of county to county migration flows do not show this pattern. These data are from the IRS, which brings me to my third point. I contacted the IRS. What happened during 2015 to 2017? They reported an increase in fraudulent tax filing. That's going to show up as people moving just because of the fraudulent filing, not because people have actually moved. So there are a number of reasons why this particular chart makes out migration seem more extreme than it probably was. Another reason is that the net outflows do not account for international immigration or natural population increase. So the Bay Area is not shrinking. This shows you the number of people who started the Bay, who lived in the Bay Area in let's say 2011, and we're still there in 2012. Bay Area is not shrinking, it's growing, according to um, these data here. So the takeaway from this is that yes, domestic migration is outwards on net, but it's very small, it's a very small fraction re relative to the population of the Bay Area. So um, I talked about very briefly some growth in the Bay Area, some costs that we're, we're considering, and now on to our outlook. So we're projecting employment growth to slow this year and next. Similarly with uh, real personal income growth, we're expecting slowing this year and then a little pick back up in 2021. Uh, a couple comments here, first on payroll employment. So unemployment in the Bay Area is incredibly low and there are these costs that I talked to you about earlier in this presentation. So for those reasons, um, it's going to be more difficult for employers to find new employees, which is going to tend to put downward pressure on uh, employment growth. With respect to personal incomes, so we can't completely get away from the coronavirus here, so a couple things we're thinking about. Uh, one, there's certainly going to be economic activity that goes away and doesn't come back. A classic example is restaurant meals not eaten. So you're, you're in this case, when uh, tourists and individuals start coming, you know, coming back in full force, they can't eat you know, three times as many meals to make up for the meals that they didn't eat when they weren't in the city. So that's certainly one possibility. Another thing we're thinking about is that uh, to the extent that Bay Area incomes are closely tied to asset markets, um, through things like IPU activity or uh, compensation packages that could affect real personal income growth. Um, generally, the Bay Area tends to do better than the state of California in terms of personal income growth because due to the high cost of living in the Bay Area, that's going to tend to attract individuals who have high earning potential, sort of high wage individuals, and encourage those with lower wages or a lower earning potential to leave the Bay Area. 
potentially on the plus side, it could be that the Bay Area has a mix of industries that might help it weather any effects of the coronavirus better than other regions. So to the extent that the types of firms and industries in the Bay Area are those where it's already easier for employees to work remotely, that will be um, a bit of a, a bump. Um, also, to the extent that industries and firms in the Bay Area provide remote access services, internet-based services, that individuals who are staying at home more and firms who are asking their, in, their uh, employees to stay at home more might use. So that could be a, a plus side there. And kind of which force wins out and what ends up happening is something that we cannot be certain of right now. So we hope you'll stay tuned and watch the California and the Bay Area economy with us. Mm -hmm.